Hey everybody, Rob here. It's time for a few new malicious compliance stories. First one, don't touch the emails. Well, okay then, Miss Lazy Coworker, I won't. Have fun finding a new job. Let's jump right in. Please consider subscribing for more daily Reddit stories. So, at my job, I'm one of the supervisors. It's a firm with a lot of employees all tucked into one big room and there are two supervisors and a shift leader in each shift. Morning, afternoon, night. These shifts get rotated on occasion, but we supervisors mostly rotate with them. Normally, with my typical co-supervisor, we share the responsibility of dealing with all the work-related emails. There's a lot more than one would expect, so it does sometimes take up to even a few hours of each day. One week, one of the shift leaders derped and put me together with a different supervisor, and we were basically stuck for that month. Now, she's absolutely lazy, like ridiculously so, won't even get off her ass during lunch and go eat at the cafeteria. Instead, she makes mess at her work desk, which would later be used by the supervisor of the next shift. I used to be the schmuck getting the desk from her, and it was always a crummy mess. Because of this, she does none of the actual supervising and never has. During our third day that week, she asked me why I was sitting at the desk for so long and if I had any intention of actually doing my job. I replied that I was doing the emails and she just got super pissed, telling me that was her assigned duty. This is how she and her usual supervisor split their load and told me to get out of the office and go watch the workers. She pretty much screamed it, turning red in the face and all, throwing all sorts of insults at me about how my generation never does shit. So I told her, fine, I'm never touching the emails again. We even signed unofficial workplace contracts, distributing our duties evenly, and she got the emails. Now, though technically we are all the same, I am the supervisor most likely to be promoted, so the shift leaders and the director generally talk to me and have me relay some info to the others, so I'm a lot closer to all of them than the other soups are. Well, because of this, I was the first to learn that we'd need to master Excel, and hop to it immediately. It wasn't yet officially announced, but when it was, the lazy bum I was stuck with first refused to learn it, saying it wasn't a skill listed as needed when we applied. Knowledge about Microsoft programs was listed, she kept postponing learning it until we officially got some work to do with Excel. I started doing it right away, and because this isn't something you can just do for another person, each individual soup gets credit based on how many tablets needed we make. They're for some sort of pamphlet, but I have no clue how to describe the full thing in English. So during our third week together, I do the usual routine of checking on the workers, then working with Excel until I meet my quota. Well. Because Miss Lazy Bum never used Excel, she got an official warning for not meeting the quota, and ended up only barely learning some stuff about Excel. She was still super slow, and couldn't even meet the quota, let alone make up for the lost time. Now, during this, the emails, as you may have guessed, remained untouched, because Excel took her the full 8 hours. During our last week together, the director came and asked us what was going on, and why was our shift always getting clogged with the emails? Miss Lazy Bum immediately tried to pin the blame on me, but bippity boppity boo, I had the contract she insisted on us signing. Since she'd already been given a warning for not learning Excel and had previous complaints about the way she spoke to some of the other employees, she was fired. I was meant to return to my usual co-supervisor next week, but now I'm on sick leave so that might be karma bitch slapping me. Microsoft Excel can be a little bit daunting when you first get into it, but once you put a little bit of time into it, you realize it's really not that hard. Then again, I don't think that co-supervisor was working with an above average IQ. On to our next story. Well, you never said not to wear orange. Let's jump right in. I will never forget my favorite malicious compliance from my private school days. For some important background, I went to a very strict religious school, and though I was also religious, Catholic, I was not the same religion as the headmaster and founders, Baptist. 
They did not like me from day one and made it clear. I wanted to play soccer, but they only had a men's team. All the girls here play volleyball. Why don't you try that? I didn't want to play volleyball. I had played soccer for 10 years at that point. I wanted to play popular Christian rock songs for music ministry and was told that we weren't allowed to play that devil worship music. Tons of stuff like that. I was in the office more than once despite being a mild-mannered freshman. Another important note is that at this time I had a pretty, we'll call it punk style I guess. I did a lot of shopping at PacSun, Hop Topic and most of what I owned was black. Normal teen stuff, I also had very, very long brown hair that would often fall in my face. Think Violet from the first half of The Incredibles. This will be important. Things continued to get worse over the next two years. Finally, at the beginning of my junior year, I was called into the guidance office. The headmaster, guidance counselor, and my English teacher were there for an intervention. OP, we're very concerned about you. You don't seem to be very social. Are you happy? Are you having dark thoughts? I'm perfectly happy, and I have a ton of friends. What made you think that there was something wrong? We're all just a little concerned about how you present yourself. What is that supposed to mean? Mrs. English interrupting loudly. Well, it's probably because you dress in all black, baggy clothes, and your hair is always in your face. It'd be nice if we could see you smile and know you're all right. What's wrong with wearing black? I just feel comfortable in these clothes. Plus, the baggy pants aren't that baggy and they help me avoid accidentally breaking the pants must not be skin tight rule in the dress code. And I'm proud of my long hair. It's taken me years to get it this long. I'm perfectly happy. I'm just wearing what I like the most. Well, we'd like to see you wearing happier looking outfits. You really should make an effort to fit in among your peers. And you should try wearing more happy colors. Wearing harsh blacks will only make us wonder how you're doing. It's safe to say I was horribly insulted. Wearing black didn't make me suicidal, and I had great life at that point. So cue the malicious compliance. I spent the next few days investigating, waiting for the nugget of information that would make this compliance so sweet. Juicy, if you will. Finally, my English teacher says offhandedly, while insulting yet another student, I just hate the color orange. It's such an unbearably ugly color. There it was. My plan was ready. I filled my closet with orange. Bright orange top. Striped orange jacket. Puffy orange vest. My favorite was an iridescent, fluorescent orange rain jacket. Honestly, I don't like the color orange either, but I did what I had to do. So almost every day for the rest of junior year, I wore an orange shirt and pulled back my long hair to make it even more visible. Then I sat in the front center seat of Mrs. English's class and made her stare at my bright orange shirt. I could see the disdain in her face every time. A few of my friends got in on it occasionally too. After about a month, she made a comment about how it was nice to see me putting some more variety in my wardrobe, but why did I have to pick orange? I just said, well, you didn't want me to wear black anymore, but isn't orange a great color? And I didn't stop wearing orange until the end of the year. Well OP, I guess orange is the new black after all. I would have taken this one a little farther and put some black prison numbers on the orange shirts, you know, just to let them know how I felt about their rules. On to our last story, boss asks me to report 100% of vehicle damage. Let's jump right in. I used to work as a supervisor of a security team at a large industrial facility. I had a good relationship with the manager, we will call him Dave, until he appointed his friend as a middle manager. We will call him Steve, between the supervisors and himself. I did not have a good relationship with Steve at all, and suddenly Dave started rejecting ideas, suggestions, and requests out of hand. The friendly guy that I used to go and have sit-down chats with regularly became standoffish and outwardly hostile at times. The staff all noticed this as well and would frequently comment that they didn't know what I'd done to Dave and Steve but it was clear that I was being bullied all of a sudden. 
it's entirely fair to say that I couldn't do right for doing wrong all the time, and every little thing I did or did not do resulted in a lengthy email conversation with Dave and Steve. There is a lot I could add to this, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to move on to the point of my story. The site we had to patrol was about 5 square miles, so vehicles were provided so that we could patrol effectively and carry equipment and personnel to required locations. Part of my duties at the start of the shift were ensuring that the vehicles had not been damaged on the previous shift, and that all vehicles had the required levels of equipment in them. The first patrol went out the moment our shift started, and as this was a regulatory requirement, could not be delayed or skipped. This was the start of a night shift, and so it was dark, very dark. We had mag light torches, but after six years of use and abuse, they weren't exactly brilliant. I didn't find any new damage, and so recorded that the vehicles were okay, and recorded their mileage on our check sheets. The next night when I came in, I had a very angry in tone email from Dave, demanding to know why my team had damaged one of the vehicles on the previous night. Apparently, the vehicle looked as if it had been reversed into a wall. I immediately went to check the vehicle and found two extremely small divots in the rear bumper. I found them not by looking, but by feeling the bumper. I simply could not see them at all using the light available to me at this time. I then went and asked all my team and all them insisted they had not even used the vehicle. I went and checked the vehicle check sheets and found true to my team's word, that the mileage on the day shift sheet was identical to the night shift sheet. The vehicle had not been moved. I sent an email back to Dave informing him that the vehicle hadn't been used by us and apologized for missing the damage. However, lighting had made it extremely difficult. This was my last shift before my scheduled days off, so I was certain that Steve would be pushing Dave to punish me for something by the time I got back. Sure enough, on my first day back in, I was summoned to Dave's office for what we British politely refer to as a bullocking. Dave insisted that he could see the damage in the dark and could actually spot it from about 10 meters away. For context, all of my guys had been shown the damage and all of them, without fail, had said where when I pointed it out at close range. Not only that, but there was now additional damage that I hadn't spotted and my team was also now responsible for. For Dave and Steve, however, this was good enough to be punitive towards me and my team, and told me that unless a culprit was found and named, I would be held personally responsible, and would have to pay the insurance excess to get it fixed. Dave also insisted that the lighting was more than sufficient to spot the damage on the vehicles. I told Dave that this was ridiculous, and he couldn't enforce financial penalties, on a vehicle that had, again, not been used by my team. Dave was insistent though, it was my job to report 100% of the damage on the vehicles or I would be held responsible. And at this point, something clicked in my mind and luckily, Dave decided to back up his instruction with an email that Steve was CC'd into. The next shift, I refused to allow my team to use the vehicles until they had all been fully checked inside, outside, underneath, mechanically, and equipment levels. Each vehicle took about two hours. I photographed every single small bit of damage that I found, no matter how insignificant or whether it had been reported previously. Remember, the instruction was to report 100% of damage, not 100% of unreported damage, and sent it all in an email to Dave with a text description of the nature and location of the damage for each photograph. There were 162 photographs in total. The first patrol could not be skipped, and so I had to send out one of my officers on foot to patrol the site. This meant that the site patrol took nearly three hours, and he was not available to fulfill other duties afterwards. It's worth noting at this point that my team were also seeing this as a direct attack on them, rather than just me so were fully supportive of the measures I was taking. This resulted in the site shift manager demanding answers, to which I was able to tell the shift manager of Dave's instructions 
and why I was having to send officers out on foot. I had, and still do have, a great relationship with all of the site shift managers, and so, while he was frustrated, he understood the predicament I had been put in, especially when the instructions were shown him in black and white. This resulted in a financial penalty for my company. Dave was off the next day, so I did the exact same thing again, with the exact same amount of photographs, but all taken again on a fresh inspection. The night shift after, I came to work to find Dave waiting in the office for me. I was allowed to finish my handover with the off-going supervisor before Dave shut the door and refused to let me leave before he had discussed why he had received multiple emails over 800 megabytes in total. I didn't compress or reduce the size of the photos and how the company had received a financial penalty and the regulatory body were coming to speak to him. I reminded him that he had demanded that I report 100% of the damage on the vehicles and that this had taken time. I couldn't allow any member of the team to use any vehicle until they had been checked as there could be financial penalties involved. Dave frustratedly pointed out that many of the pics were too dark to see anything anyway, and so most of the photographs were pointless. I apologized for the lighting, but pointed out that he said the lighting was more than sufficient to spot any damage, and so he should be able to easily see the damage I had reported. Dave insisted that I had deliberately misinterpreted his instructions, and he would be taking it to a disciplinary. I informed him that this was no problem. If he could just let me know the date and time, I would inform my union rep, who had been fully appraised of the situation and was 100% behind my suggestion, that I report every single tiny bit of damage on the vehicles. Dave was ultimately left with no choice but to drop any attempts to discipline me and left Steve to deal with me from that point on. Steve then took up the role of disciplinarian for the next three months until I left the job. However, every time he tried, I was able to shut it all down due to briefings with my union rep. I left the job in February of 2019 and still, to this day, receive complaints from members of staff who remain there about how terrible the job has gotten due to Dave and Steve. I've said this in many videos before, but you can have an amazing job and absolutely love the job itself, but if you have a bad manager, it makes going to work horrible. I'm glad OP was able to get out of that situation, and I hope they're doing really well at this point. I'd like to thank all three OPs for posting their stories to the Malicious Compliance subreddit, You can visit them at the links in the description below. Please go there and give them an upvote. Once again, this is Rob from Karma Comment Chameleon saying thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and share it with your friends. And we'll see you in the next one.